Good day. My name is Paul Watts. I'm the executive director of the American College of Medical Toxicology. I'd like to welcome you all to our weekly webinar series on the medical and public health considerations of COVID-19. Today's uh, presentation will be on pulmonary manifestations of COVID-19. Next slide, please. I'd like to uh, thank uh, all of our webinar series partners, and also I'd like to uh, welcome our newest partner, the American Academy of Emergency Nurse Practitioners, who will be joining us uh, this week uh, going forward. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All the webinars are recorded and are posted to the ACMT website, typically within 48 hours. Um, uh, more information regarding uh, COVID-19 resources can be found at uh, acmt.net forward slash COVID-19 web. And any questions about the webinar series can be addressed to us at info at acmt.net. Next slide. At the end of the webinar, uh, there will be a Q&A uh, period. Uh, this will be uh, usually lasting about 15 to 20 minutes or so. So please uh, type in your questions into the Q&A uh, or the chat function during the webinar and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we monitor all platforms, and so those of you on YouTube and Facebook can uh, uh, can uh, type in your questions into those platforms as well. Next slide. There are no uh, conflicts of interest of any of the speakers. Next slide. Um, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, co-moderator, uh, Ziad Kazi, uh, for uh, his work uh, on uh, this series and Ziad will be running the Q&A later on in the program. Next slide. I'd like to welcome our guest moderator, uh, Dr. Lisa Moreno. Dr. Moreno is the president elect of the American Academy of Emergency uh, Medicine, AAEM. She's also a professor of emergency medicine and director of research and director of diversity in the section of emergency medicine at the Louisiana State University Health Sciences in New Orleans, Los Angeles. Welcome Dr. Moreno. Thank you. It is an honor for me to be a moderator here, and AAM is really proud to be a co-sponsor of this, uh, this webinar, a partner in this webinar, which has really brought some amazing information to physicians and nurses who are taking care of COVID patients. And now it's going to be my honor to introduce Dr. Cameron Kyle Seidel. Dr. Kyle Seidel is board certified in emergency medicine, and he practices emergency medicine and critical care at the Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. He is a well-respected expert on ventilator management and COVID-19. And this is actually his second presentation for us on this webinar series. So I'm gonna turn it over now to you, Cameron. Thank you very much. You can hear me okay, I hope. Um, Okay, uh, uh, great. So, um, you know, what I'm going to do in this talk is we're going to go a little bit beyond uh, the language uh, of ARDS. Um, and we're going to actually follow this search uh, for a model of COVID-19 lung injury and, and then think about how it affects uh, what we do at the bedside, its clinical uh, implications. Uh, so before, before I go there, we'll just step back a little bit. And uh, this is the second time I've talked to you all. And the last time I talked to you, my hospital in New York City was being absolutely uh, pummeled uh, by this virus. And, and this is an illustration that accompanied a, a personal account uh, of a colleague of mine. Uh, um, and if you are at all interested in reading a sort of a ground, uh, a ground level personal account of, of uh, what happened as we headed towards the peak, I, I urge you to go to his website at EM, EM Updates. But at that time, you know, I told you that uh, from what I was seeing, it seemed to be uh, that there was a possibility that we'll, we were dealing with something we had never seen. And that the constellation of symptoms seemed to at least most mirror uh, some kind of viral uh, mediated uh, um, a destruction leading to a, a mirror of decompression pulmonary sickness. So everything I talk about now is gonna be what we've learned from that point uh, in, until now. Um, so first, you know, let's start, there's, there's been a big debate about whether uh, COVID-19 is ARDS. And if you're at all tuned in, uh, to, um, you know, what's been going on with research. You've certainly heard about this debate. So let, let's start with what we expected uh, that we would see uh, heading into this pandemic. And that was a disease 
uh, which was primarily defined by uh, alveolar flooding, where you had this real protein-rich uh, inflammatory exudates filling up the alveoli in the setting of a widened interstitium, uh, a lot of inflammation and sort of the interface between the capillary uh, and, and the alveoli epithel alveolar epithelium and a swollen uh, endothelium. Um, and why is that important? Because with that disease, you would expect a disease that would have you know, a low compliance. And you've heard this sort of debate about lung compliance, uh, which has sort of been going back and forth. And this is the ARMA trial, which is sort of the landmark of the landmark uh, of lung protective uh, ventilation trials. And in it on the right, you can see uh, the quartiles of static compliance. And at least the, the, the three to the left, uh, for the most part, they use different um, uh, they use uh, mill milliliters over centimeters per kilogram, so they're different measurements. But for the most part, when we talk about you know having poor compliance or just not so good compliance, we're talking about a compliance that's sort of in the 40s or less. Um, and yet, in some of the stuff that came out of Italy and, and principally, principally Gattinoni's early work, uh, he pointed to having a, a lot of plant patients with a higher compliance. So if you look at the blue graph and you look at the number 50, which certainly is not a normal compliance in, in everyone that's sort of walking around normally, but is higher than one would expect uh, in typical ARDS, you have a large portion of patients on the right side of that 50. Um, and that's happening in the setting of having a great many patients that also have what we call large shunt fractions. Uh, which is to say uh, blood is moving from the right side to the, of the heart to the left side, going throughout the lungs uh, without actually uh, being oxygenated. Uh, and that is highly unusual for what we would say is a typical ARDS state. And, and so he separated it into these two different phenotypes um, where 20 to 30 percent of the patients have these stiff, heavy lungs that sort of fit the ARDS uh, profile we were expecting to see. And, and yet over 50 percent have these thinner uh, uh, compliant lungs that don't fit that classic uh, ARDS profile. And, and this has led to a tremendous amount of debate. And, and certainly um, there's been uh, some case series that haven't necessarily supported this. The case series come out of Boston and Seattle that, that do show that, you know, patients do have poor compliance. And yet many people at the bedside are finding, you know, that patients do seem to have a higher compliance than we would necessarily expect. Now, I'll tell you before we go forward, you know, I think really what we're seeing is less of different phenotypes and stages of the disease. And so what we're really going to work through with this model is we're going to go through the stages of the disease. Um, and, and to do that, I think we have to sort of leave uh, the ARDS debate behind, because certainly I think most people would certainly agree that most of our very severe COVID patients fit the Berlin criteria. Um, so, you know, they, the injury we're seeing does come within sort of a week of them getting, you know, very sick with their disease. They have bilateral infiltrates. You know, it's not primarily cardiac and they have very low oxygen levels. So from this point forward, you know, I think we just should accept, you know, that, that COVID is as ARDS, you know, as influenza. They might just be different kinds. So we're going to go beyond this debate and we're actually going to go and try to figure out what is exactly going on. Now, why is this important? Because ARDS really is just it's a criteria similar to acute kidney injury being a cri criteria. But when someone comes to us with acute kidney injury, we don't stop there. We try to figure out what the etiology of that injury is because some patients, for example, will benefit from extremely high dose steroids in acute kin kidney injury and, and some won't. And in the same sense with a, a you know, primary intervention of life support like renal replacement therapy or mechanical uh, ventilation, there is a debate about initiating it early or late. So we're going to dive in a little bit deeper. We're going to go beyond at the model of what's happening. Now, uh, uh, this work comes from uh, Dr. Fareed Jalali, who I've been in close contact with, uh, who interestingly is actually a GI doctor, uh, but has a, a close family in Iran that, that suffered from this disease. And so very early on, he really put his mind to figure out what was going on. And so this is sort of the best model from the data we have to figure out what exactly is going on. And, and that's what we really want to get to. So we know the SARS virus uh, gains entry into the cell uh, by binding its spike protein with the ACE2 receptor. And now before we go on, there is a big question which we don't necessarily know the answer to. And that is exactly how cytopathic is this COVID-19 to the pulmonary epithelium? And, and why is that important? Well, if we thought initially that there was uh, a large damage to the pulmonary epithelium in the pulmonary uh, um, uh, alveolar epithelium, you would expect uh, there to be a disease whereby, 
even from the beginning, you were getting some alveolar damage and, and that was hurting your compliance. So I suspect that there probably is not as much damage uh, as with other uh, viral um, or bacterial uh, respiratory agents. In any case, uh, the COVID-19 virus gains entry to the pulmonary uh, alveolar epithelium and, and causes a down regulation through the ACE2 receptor and causes a down regulation of the ACE2 receptor um, while the ACE receptor is unaffected. So why is that important? Well, that's important. This is some work from 2005 in Nature uh, that showed that the, the ACE2 receptor actually protects from severe acute lung injury. So these were uh, mice that, that had the ACE2 receptor knocked out uh, and wild type mice, uh, you know, normal mice. And, and they were both uh, given both saline and acid, you know, down their throats and, and into their lungs. And you can see sort of in the bottom of these pictures, uh, you know, the bottom right is the ACE knockout mice. So they don't have the ACE2 receptor and the bottom left is with the ACE2 receptor. And you can see on the bottom right, there's just increased uh, edema, increased uh, hyaline membrane formation, uh, which suggests that the ACE2 receptor protects from severe lung injury. And yet in this disease, you have an ACE2 receptor down regulation. So you have an imbalance. You have increased ACE uh, with less ACE2. And why is that important? Well, ACE turns uh, angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And then when you look at the top, angiotensin 2 is converted by ACE2 into angiotensin 1-7. So by having a down regulation of ACE2, what you actually get is a relative excess of angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is a vasoconstrictive molecule. It's pro-inflammatory and it's pro-thrombotic. Uh, and in excess, it is not counterbalanced by angiotensin 1-7, uh, which is uh, the counterbalanced uh, vasodilatory molecule. So what does that lead to? Well, if you're looking at the normal pulmonary microvasculature, and now you have an angiotensin 2 mediated vasoconstrictive process, uh, what you get is sort of progressive vasoconstriction, you know, severe endothelial dysfunction, which causes increased vascular permeability uh, and leukocyte recruitment. And what you really have is you have an increasingly immunologically active pulmonary endothelium. And that leads uh, to a state of ischemic uh, injury uh, with microthrombosis. And increasingly, uh, there's been proposals, you know, from the time I talked to you before till now, we're increasingly coming to understand the importance of this microthrombotic uh, ischemic of vascular injury uh, in this disease process. And so even sort of early on, or, or May 7th, uh, it, uh, it came out in the Lancet, they actually coined a new term, which is pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy, which is separate from disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, which is a, a systemic thing. This is uh, just specific to the pulmonary endothelium. And they noted that you have extensive interstitial uh, immunocyte activation that's causing sort of diffuse pulmonary bed, pulmonary bed extrinsic inflammation, which what they call is immunothrombosis. And so what we really have here is a microthrombotic immunopathology. And sure enough, uh, and this was only about six days ago, and, but this was a major article that you know many people have uh, probably by now heard about. Uh, but this was the first, there's been a series of, of autopsies that, uh, uh, whereby the pathologist did note that there was a surprising amount of microthrombi, a surprising amount of uh, vascular injury. But this was the first one that really compared it um, to another disease process known to cause ARDS, and, and that was influenza. And they noted that, you know, alveolar capillary microthrombi were nine times as prevalent in patients with COVID uh, as in patients with influenza. And, and this was on the same day release, you know, so what is happening? What is happening in the lungs of our patients uh, with COVID? Because that's really what we want to get to. We want to know what's happening so we can try to direct our therapy to it. And, and so this is from nature. And what's really happening, uh, likely happening, is that you have the vasculature being unleashed. You know, and what does that mean? Uh, it means that through a direct uh, um, uh, endothelial cell infection of the of the COVID virus, and, and when it actually 
gets into the capillary epithelium is hard to say when it moves from the or the capillary endothelium when it moves from the alveolar epithelium to the capillary endothelium is hard to say but there has been uh, uh, autopsies where they have certainly noticed uh, um, direct uh, endothelial cell infection um, and that is because you also have ACE2 receptors on the endothelium and that actually occurs throughout throughout the body but you have direct endothelial uh, endothelial cell infection causing an endotheliolitis. Um, you have endothelial uh, prothrombotic immunologic activation and enhanced endothelial cell contractility. And, and, and so this is likely uh, what is causing our patients when they sort of start coming to the ER and, and they start getting hypoxemic, it, it is likely due uh, to sort of an endothelial dominant process or an endothelial initiating process. And again, why is this important? This is important because we want to figure out how to treat people better. That is, that is our goal. Um, and, and as this article noted, uh, the pulmonary endothelial cells have often been overlooked as a therapeutic target. Uh, but now, uh, you know, with this proposed model, uh, if we accept this central role of the endothelial cells in COVID-19 disease, um, then it prompts the question, it forces us to ask the question, are there ways we can pursue vascular normalization strategies uh, uh, during this maladaptive immune response? Are there ways we can try to uh, stabilize uh, the pulmonary endothelium? Um, and so really, this is sort of our, our new model. And again, you know, I want to leave the ARDS uh, debate behind uh, because both COVID and influenza, we accept cause ARDS and in the end stages uh, will cause uh, diffuse alveolar damage. Um, but what I would say of COVID-19 is likely it is an endothelial dominant ARDS. Um, so if you look at the picture to the left, which is more of our typical ARDS, we have this alveolar flooding, you certainly still have involvement of the pulmonary vasculature. And you can see that you still have, you know, a swollen pulmonary vasculature, you have platelet aggregation, you have leukocyte adhesion, uh, but it seems to be more of an epithelial or an alveolar dominant ARDS. Whereas on the picture of uh, on the right, where you have sort of this unleashed vasculature, uh, that you have an endothelial dominant ARDS and, and that the primary process which is causing this injury uh, is likely occurring right there in the capillaries with inflammation, uh, um, coagulation, vasoconstriction, and, and you know we're seeing very high D-dimers. Um, and the question is moving forward, how can we target that and how can we cause or how can we help to stabilize this endothelium? So now I wanna sort of progress on um, and see what this does sort of in our patient's lungs um, and see what we're actually seeing at the bedside and the decisions uh, that we have to make. And, and so, you know, we're sort of moving out of the first phase of this disease, uh, which is, you know, primarily a, a, um, a microthrombotic uh, a vascular uh, immune disease and, and kind of see what occurs from then. So this is a model uh, an anatomical model of our lungs. And you can see the alveolar space uh, there. And that yellow stuff is sort of that vasoconstricted uh, thrombotic vasculature. And, and certainly when that occurs, you're going to have surrounding interstitial edema. And, and more and more, we're, we're, we know that, you know, all these findings we're seeing on CT early and sort of in the periphery, that likely rather than alveolar consolidation, um, these are uh, interstitial uh, edema and interstitial processes, which is also why when we look on ultrasounds, uh, we see uh, lots of beelines uh, as opposed to a, a consolidated process. In any case, you have the alveolar capillary uh, um, angiotensin II excess mediated vasoconstriction and, and microthrombi. Um, and this helps to explain this model, some of the novel CT, work, CT findings um, that we're seeing. And so this was a, an earlier CT, which suggested that the CT findings uh, were, were unusual and, and seemed to be a novel uh, imaging findings for COVID-19 pneumonia. And, and what were those imaging findings? Uh, well, they saw that there was increased perfusion, increased blood flow proximal to the areas of consolidation. 
There was also decreased blood flow within the areas of consolidation, and there was a surrounding halo of increased perfusion around the consolidation. So again, you had increased flow heading towards the, the consolidation and increased flow around it. And this is unusual. And you know, certainly you could think, what about you know, pulmonary emboli? Uh, certainly you could have increased sort of a proximal uh, perfusion as, as it, you know, they get, the vessels get dilated and build up, but you wouldn't expect uh, sort of the increased perfusion around it. And, and you could see with these green arrows on the left, what they saw were these dilated subsegmental vessels, uh, both inside and outside the consolidation. And so this model makes sense. Um, so, you know, if you think as these alveolar capillaries are becoming progressively microthrombotic and progressively vasoconstricted and progressively uh, destroyed, you would expect sort of a backflow uh, of blood as blood is unable to, to get through these, these more and more diseased capillaries. Um, now, the unusual thing is one would expect uh, if this was happening on a great level, throughout the lung, you would expect increases in your PA pressures, which is to say you'd expect that the flow would come back from all these different capillary buds being destroyed and eventually show higher pressures in your pulmonary artery. And we weren't necessarily seeing that. And most people that have put in pulmonary artery catheters um, and have sort of looked for evidence of right heart dysfunction, um, sort of at this stage of disease, haven't found it. Um, and so that is unusual. Um, and so it is possible. And this, I want to say, is not proven. This is not proven, but it is certainly a possibility to explain what we're seeing. And we do know you have bronchial pulmonary anastomoses um, uh, uh, between the bronchial circulation and the pulmonary circulation. And they're usually bidirectional, um, which means blood flow can go either way. And why is that important? Well, usually if you have a clot you know, uh, right before a capillary, um, uh, rather than your alveoli getting ischemic, it can steal some blow, blood flow from the uh, bronchial circulation. In this case, as the pressure builds up uh, in the precapillary region, you can have backflow uh, through the bronchial anastomoses um, into the bronchial circulation. Um, and this may explain some of these CT findings. And, and so here, if you look at the, this is a, a sequential CTs on the same patients, okay? And, and so if you look at the CT on the left, uh, they, you find these um, uh, enlarged tubular uh, uh, um, subsegmental uh, vessels. Um, and in, they showed in this one that initially you get this uh, uh, tubular vessel and later you've got an opacity in the area of that this vessel. Um, and so that makes sense with this model and what we're seeing. Um, and yet they also noted that you had a sudden reduction as you move more proximally, a sudden reduction in the caliber of the vessel. And, and possibly that's at the level of the bronchial pulmonary anastomosis where now blood flow uh, is going in there. Um, and so this is essentially what could be happening. And this is your shunt, um, is that you have a... a, a a backflow through the bronchial circulation, you know, back into the left atrium, bypassing uh, uh, areas of gas. And so essentially you do have uh, intrapulmonary shunting uh, with a low VQ mismatch, which is to say you have perfusion of blood uh, through areas where there is not uh, gas exchange. Now, again, I want to uh, say that this really is just a model, um, but it is a model that makes the most sense to me um, and, and explains a lot of things. For example, uh, why when we prone patients, uh, patients uh, persistently or consistently um, ha have a good response. And, and that's uh, because these regions of the lung that are, are the most destroyed early on, we, we've seen radiographically are the dorsal regions. Um, and so when you turn them over, uh, essentially this blood pooling, which has been occurring in the, in the most diseased dorsal regions, you shift blood flow uh, to the ventral regions that, that are less diseased. Um, and it also explains why when you flip them back in the supine position, they don't have a sustained uh, benefit because it is not actually alveolar recruitment that you're necessarily getting, which is typically what we expect uh, with proning, but you're just moving blood flow around. Um, now, these patients, once you have this shunting, are now getting very sick. Okay, and so they're in the later stages of the disease. 
um, and possibly are at the point now uh, where we feel that we have to add some positive pressure. Right? Their auction levels are going low. The shunting is very bad. And, and so this is the time when we're deciding, do we need to intubate them? Do we need to put them um, on non-invasive? Uh, you know, and so what's the benefit of that? Well, we improve their oxygen. Um, but this picture shows a little bit of the downside of that. All right, so if you look at the picture on the left and you look at the alveolar capillaries, which are the circles in the gray, um, and then you look at the picture just right of that, uh, where the alveoli are actually bigger, uh, what it does and what has been shown is that it actually does increase the resistance of these vessels. And that's what the graph to the right shows, is as you increase the volume, you increase the resistance of the intraalveolar vessels. And so you can imagine that these vessels that are already thrombotic, ischemic, um, when you initiate positive pressure ventilation, or when a patient takes a very big deep breath, you, you certainly can see how further constriction should can occur, uh, eventually leading to further ischemia, uh, um, alveolar damage, um, uh, and the release of cytokines. Um, and that is not to say, I want to be clear, that's not to say that this wouldn't occur normally. This is likely what occurs. I do believe many patients' love, oxygen levels will go low, uh, that they'll pass before this ever actually occurs. And, and so I suspect you wouldn't have as diffuse alveolar damage as you would in a more uh, alveolar dominant uh, ARDS. Uh, but certainly this can occur naturally. Um, but there is also a way you can see um, that with the initiation of higher tidal volumes uh, with positive pressure ventilation, uh, you may expedite this process. Um, now our job is to preserve life. And so these patients' oxygen levels are so low that we have to initiate life support, and many patients have to be mechanically ventilated. Uh, we have now moved beyond the part of stabilizing their endothelium uh, um, and uh, normalizing their vasculature. But, but when we put them on mechanical ventilation, maybe we do need to think not just of lung protective ventilation, but of endothelial protective ventilation. How do we protect not just the alveoli, but the vessels? And by protecting the vessels and doing so, you are protecting the alveoli. Uh, so, you know, not just to avoid uh, ventilator induced lung injury, but ventilator induced vascular lung injury. Um, and this leads to the question of when we intubate. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're not pulmonary trained or critical care trained, these flow curves may seem foreign to you. I just want you to concentrate on, on the, uh, the fourth one from the top. Uh, um, that is your transmural pressure, uh, and that is actually what the lung sees. It's the pressure between the alveoli uh, and the pleura. And in this sense, in the first column, you have a patient that's fully mechanically ventilated. ventilated. In the second column, you have a patient that's breathing on their own. And in the third, you have one that's uh, um, partially being supported with the ventilator and partially breathing on their own. And you can see uh, that with all of them, uh, you can create the same transmural pressure. So we are watching these patients always trying to think uh, uh, which is worse, which is riskier, uh, the chance that they'll have ventilator-induced lung injury or, or the chance that their breathing is becoming, um, the work of breathing becoming so hard that they're creating such high pressures in their chest that, that they're doing injury to themselves. Um, and why is this important? Because it certainly is possible, and, and I think it's becoming increasingly accepted um, that the pulmonary, that the lung is sort of the engine for multi-organ failure. And what do I mean that, by that? Um, that really the damaged pulmonary endothelium uh, seems to be the initiating cause for multi-organ failure. And, and you can see in this uh, case series of COVID-19 patients from New York City, um, that uh, there's vast differences between the patient's who need vasal support on those who are intubated and those who are not intubated, those who are on ventilation and not ventilation, 95% to 1.5%, and those who had uh, cardiac arrhythmias and, and those who needed um, uh, renal replacement therapy. And that is not to say, there is. it is obvious that patients who require medical, mechanical ventilation are certainly the sickest. And that is also a very likely explanation. You know, at the same time, uh, I, I do think uh, whether the patient is... Uh, creating high volumes on their own, leading to lung damage, or, or we're creating high volumes for them. This is something we need to think about. And again, we need to try to, to figure out how to protect this endothelium, uh, which may be the engine for multi-organ failure and eventual death. Um, and so this is just the, the large model. Um, and you can go to uh, um, Dr. Jalali's uh, Twitter account to kind of get more information. But why is this important? So, you know, that first phase we talked about, which was the 
a vascular um, uh, uh, immuno a thrombosis uh, pathologic phase, that's really the first phase. And, and sort of the second phase is that phase where you have these proximal vessel dilations and, and this massive shunting. And, and it may be that there are different therapies at different stages, but once we accept this as the model, once we see that really this microthrombosis angiotensin II mediated uh, uh, vascular dysfunction is the primary reason why these patients are progressing along this uh, terrible pathway uh, towards uh, ARDS towards diffuse alveolar damage, then you can start to talk about what we can do to try to stabilize the endothelium. Um, and so here on the left, you see, you know, if we're talking about vascular normalization strategies, and I want to be clear, none of these have been, had randomized controlled trials, and none of them have been uh, um, uh, tested uh, through those uh, methodological or uh, um, through those, uh, you know, strict methods. But you can see from this how you can just from this information, plausibly imagine many, many trials uh, being done. And, and so how do you treat the endothelitis? Uh, you know, maybe ACE inhibitors are good in these early stages. Again, it's an imbalance between ACE and uh, ACE2, um, and you have a sort of a lack of downregulation of ACE2. And so were you to block ACE, it may be helpful. And, you know, the same with statins and vitamin C, you know, Paul Merrick's group uh, uh, believes that it really does help with endothelial stabilization. The same thing with thrombosis. We can talk about platelet agents, anticoagulation, things to decrease uh, leukocyte recruitment, uh, even Montelukast, uh, curcumin, and, and things to help with the initial vasoconstrictive process. And in the same vein, uh, it makes sense why people that have natural uh, endothelial instability, uh, um, you know, those that are older, those that have uh, um, a cholesterol problems, smokers, diabetes, hypertension, maybe, you know, at, at a higher chance of succumbing from this, this uh, terrible disease. Um, and so just lastly, going back to this uh, initial clinical syndrome of decompression of pulmonary sickness, so we can, you know, think about, you know, possibly they are, and it seems to be they are, or they both may be a disease primarily initiated by a microthrombotic immunopathology. Uh, in the one sense, you have uh, angio on COVID-19, you have angiotensin II causing you know, pulmonary dysfunction and, and clotting and vasoconstriction. And, and in decompression pulmonary sickness, you have uh, nitrogen bubbles, air bubbles coming out of the tissues and, and likely causing some of the same uh, endothelial dysfunction and endothelial activation. Um, and in that sense, perhaps you know, what uh, the treatment uh, for decompression pulmonary sickness to, to stabilize the endothelium, to, to, to help with the immune response, perhaps it could work and it could help uh, with COVID-19. You know, I think in the, in the end, the goal as we move forward will be to, to stabilize this endothelium such that mechanical ventilation uh, uh, will hopefully, for the majority of patients or, or, or for more patients than, than now, uh, will not be necessary. And, and so with that, I'll, I'll pass it off uh, to Keith. Thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kyle Seidel. You have been one of the people who is really changing the way that COVID care is delivered and increasing survival for our patients. So thank you for explaining the rationale for customized COVID respiratory care in a way that all levels of healthcare professionals can comprehend. Um, you gave a great transition to our next speaker when you mentioned decompression sickness. But before I introduce my boss, Dr. Van Meter, I do wanna remind everyone that we are streaming on YouTube and Facebook and we do want you to use the chat feature for your Q&A. If you can start sending the questions to us, then we'll have them available to ask at the end portion of the presentation. The presentation is being recorded and the recording will be available on Friday for you to share with colleagues who couldn't be here today. But please start sending your questions to us by the chat Q&A feature. So now I'm going to introduce Dr. Keith Van Meter. He is board certified in emergency medicine, undersea and hyperbaric medicine, and medical toxicology. And he is a clinical professor of surgery at Tulane Medicine, in addition to being the chief of our service at um, Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center. And he's the director of hyperbaric services at several hospitals in the greater New Orleans area. And he will be talking to us about using hyperbaric oxygen therapy for COVID-19 treatment. Keith, would you proceed? 
Yes, thank you very much. Actually, I think it's a few slides back. Hyperbaric medicine uh, did start with um, the 1918 uh, COVID um, Spanish flu epidemic. Um, and it was uh, uh, provided by an anesthesiologist uh, from uh, the city of, uh, of uh, Kansas City, uh, Kansas. And he um, had a large chamber installed in his side yard and the Fort uh, Funston uh, soldiers that were coming down with uh, pulmonary complications from the Spanish flu. Uh, it was called the Blue Death in that uh, that day uh, because of the cyanosis. Were put into a state truck and brought down to his chamber, and he would uh, uh, descend the chamber in pressurization to uh, anywhere from sixty to ninety feet, and treat the patients, and they would pink up and do immeasurably better. Uh, and he um, went on to uh, treat quite a few this way. Next slide. Well, what what could have been going on? Well, in later time, uh, a very good researcher, uh, Steve Tom, uh, at the time from the University of Pennsylvania, worked uh, with hyperbaric uh, oxygen uh, to find that it actually impeded white blood cell um, adherence to endothelium. Uh, and it did it by a method of, of causing the uh, beta-2 integrins uh, moiety on the PMM membrane to um, be equidistributed like it is naturally instead of polarizing to one end and then sticking to the uh, beta-2 integrin, sticking to the ICAM, uh, uh, protruding from the endothelial cells. And you can see that in uh, this cartoon. And by soaking the plasma with a large volume percent of dissolved oxygen, this and only, only possible by hyperbarics, uh, against the control 100% groups of uh, FiO2 at one atmosphere of pressurization, the, um, this, this event occurred. And uh, the references are just listed out. His uh, uh, chapter uh, that he wrote about this is also uh, listed. Next. Well, another uh, uh, researcher uh, found that encapsulated uh, or uh, enveloped viruses uh, by, again, soaking the plasma with more dissolved oxygen than is even possible. You'll see in the slide to follow um, comparative amounts of oxygen that can be put into the plasma by solution. Uh, he found that the viral load could be uh, uh, very much reduced. Next. And the uh, potential uh, carriage of O2, um, as delineated, delineated in this paper, um, was uh, uh, impaired by uh, the beta chain on hemoglobin by the COVID uh, virus. And as you may know, hyperbaric oxygen does uh, very well in some of the toxicities that impair the uh, O2 uh, carriage capability the uh, sort of chemically imposed uh, uh, instant anemias that uh, are uh, part and parcel of uh, cyanide and uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. So uh, that is a, that is an inter especially to hyperbaric doctors. That's a very interesting aspect. That if you could use the plasma to carry the O2 instead of the RBCs, uh, that might help obviate some of the hypoxic problems. Next. And the one that is perhaps most exciting is the ability of hyperbaric oxygen to do micro uh, thrombolysis of micro thrombosis. Um, and as uh, uh, was just delineated uh, by Cameron, the 
um, this this is a, pro a major problem. And um, if if a lot of these uh, problems on diffusivity of oxygen could be improved upon by having the plasma carry the O2 and not be so reliant on formed element like RBCs yeah, intravascularly carrying the O2, um, a, a lot of the problems might be obviated. Next. And the other one that is quite interesting, it has been shown that IL-6, IL-1, um, the cytokine explosion uh, in um, in a lot of, uh, especially in sometimes in infections, can be uh, uh, mulled down or tamped down by hyperbaric oxygen uh, administration. And I might add that all of these uh, uh, paper presentations do have controlled one atmosphere, 100% uh, uh, oxygen um, application. And there is something that in a way is uh, is a paradox that actually maybe 100% oxygen uh, for prolonged periods of times or even high percentage FiO2s at one atmosphere are, are potentially very inflammatory. And the paradox is not that continuous hyperbaric oxygen producing surface equivalent FiO2s of 200% or 300% uh, would be any better, but pulsed high dose intermittent oxygen has been proven by all the navies of the world uh, to be the remedy for very inflammatory events, which uh, would be uh, gas embolism, intravascular gas embolism, or decompression sickness, uh, which destroys uh, uh, multi-organ events. Uh, most noticeably, the most sensitive in, uh, instant index is the central nervous system. Next. And just very lately, um, uh, 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 Richard Clark uh, from uh, Richland Memorial Hospital has put out an application following um, the application for ECMO for compassionate, compassionate care uh, by the approval by the FDA for hyperbaric oxygen uh, to be the same. And so we're awaiting the uh, results of that. But I might add that hyperbaric oxygen probably for treatment of uh, in compassionate care probably amounts to maybe $20,000 for several uh, days, maybe a week of, of therapy, maybe longer. And just three days of uh, ECMO often can be as high as uh, with a facility fee of $350,000. So um, in a way, uh, hyperbaric oxygen you could term it as um, non-invasive mini ECMO uh, that's periodic and uh, available to the patient. Next. So the um, inflammatory um, hy uh, profound hypoxia, if you breathe 100% oxygen at uh, sea level or one atmosphere, it only allows maximally, if everything is working, 2.3 volumes percent of dissolved oxygen. Maybe to say that uh, for some of the audience and, and uh, that 100 cc's of blood would have only 2.3 cc's of dissolved oxygen in the plasma. That's not enough uh, to support uh, uh, organ uh, uh, oxygen extraction. But at three atmospheres of pressurization, breathing 100% oxygen, produces an inhaled oxygen of 300%, and that allows in the plasma 6.6 .6 cc's of dissolved oxygen per 100 cc's of plasma. And that's more than enough organ systems in the body to include the brain uh, at rest uh, and replenish ATP, the body needing 95% of its uh, replacement by body weight every day in the molecule ATP. And so this was easily demonstrated uh, in the 1918 flu pandemic, and most recently by a Chinese study, just uh, again, a small case series, not controlled, 
and an Opelousas General Hospital in Louisiana, in the western part of the state, which almost mined the Chinese study exactly and came up with the same results with prevention of movement of a patient crashing to needing ventilator use in both studies. Next. And these are the two papers that uh, have been produced uh, remarking on those two places, the Wuhan paper and the uh, Opelousas, uh, Louisiana paper. Next. So what's really needed uh, for mainstream medicine to have a better appreciation and perhaps acceptance are randomized control trials. And um, the IRBs uh, have been put forth at Auctioner Medical Foundation in New, New Orleans, uh, at uh, already at Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm in combination with the University um, of Southern California, San Diego, and um, also in France, uh, an army installation at Toulon, France, and um, at, uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, so next. Now, this again is just the mention of the relative cost and uh, the intervention of hyperbarics is essentially non-invasive administration of dissolved plasma O2 at high, high concentrations um, and um, in a pulsed manner so that oxygen toxicity does not occur. And it actually the inflammation of uh, even oxygen toxicity of some of the commercial divers who have not had um, hyperbaric had a long amount of O2 after injury have, has, have actually been resolved uh, with hyperbaric oxygen. It's the oxygen paradox. It's, wealth worth, it's very uh, worthwhile reading about. Next. So how could pressure, which produces lung injury, ever, ever be benefited by phenomenal amounts of pressure, more than peak by far, uh, in a hyperbaric chamber. And it has to do with Pascal's law. But you wouldn't even have to know about Pascal's law. You just would have to know what it does uh, and what it represents. And it represents that when the entire body is pressurized, that the pressure transmits into all soft tissue and all air-filled tissue uh, or gas-filled tissue in the body uh, equally. And so when the ventilator settings are set in the hyperbaric chamber um, on a ventilator that's adjusted to be used in a, a hyperbaric chamber, very delicate uh, amounts of PEEP can be used without the necessity to have high PEEP to drive uh, more oxygen into solution and improve the lung uh, so it, it's lung protective. And then the oxygen paradox uh, is lung protective. And it was interesting to see when Cameron presented um, the um, areas of almost penumbra around consolidation or umbra in the lung. Um, that's what hyperbaric oxygen does the best at uh, resolving penumbra and preventing the conversion to uh, worse injury um, and obviating reperfusion injury. Next. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Van Meter, for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, at this uh, point, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, a colleague of ours uh, from Israel. Uh, most weeks, we've tried to uh, feature uh, a speaker uh, from an uh, international uh, location. Um, as we all know, this is a pandemic affecting um, all of uh, humanity across the globe. And uh, for this week's uh, update from the front line, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Opir Lavon um, from Israel. He's the chairman of the Israeli Society of Toxicology and the uh, head of the Clinical Pharmacology and Toxicology Unit at the Carmel Medical Center in Haifa, Israel. And he's going to discuss the uh, Israeli experience with COVID-19. Hello. Thank you, Paul. I think uh, I hope everybody uh, is uh, hearing me. 
Yes. Uh, so let's start. Well, this is the world, and you see Israel way here in the Middle East. And a closer look, you see the country with uh, all the uh, countries around it. And Israel is a relatively uh, small-sized country, uh, about the size of a uh, New Jersey uh, state, with a population of around uh, 9 million. Now, our health uh, system is uh, mainly public. All uh, Israeli citizens are entitled to comprehensive medical services as part of a national health insurance. We have uh, 33 general hospitals providing up, uh, up-to-date medical services. So hospitalization capacity is, uh, is not that great with uh, 16,000 uh, beds and just a few hundred critical care beds uh, uh, in uh, routine uh, uh, days. Now a few words about our poison center. Uh, it is located also uh, as my hospital in the city of Haifa at the Rambam uh, Hospital. It operates uh, uh, similarly uh, to the American poison centers, giving consultations 24-7 to the public and to the uh, medical professionals by physicians and nurses. And there are over 3,000 uh, calls per month made to the center. And during the current epidemic, the numbers are not that uh, different. And now for the COVID-19 data in Israel, uh, and the, the, the numbers you see are uh, correct uh, to Monday when I prepared the slides, but they are not that different today. Uh, you can see that uh, the cumulative uh, number of uh, confirmed COVID-19 patients is, uh, is less than uh, 17,000 uh, 17, uh, cases. This is about uh, 0.1, between 0.1 and 0.2% of the general population. Now, this figure is not that different from other countries, even many other countries. But if you look at the fatality rates, which is today actually uh, 281, about 280, this is a, a relatively low, even compared to other countries. It's about 1.7% of the confirmed cases. Uh, if you compare the US data, uh, the number of fatalities is around 5 to 6% of the confirmed cases, and it's higher in other countries. So it can uh, be explained by several uh, the factors, uh, the different uh, characteristic of diagnosis, but also uh, by the younger median age of the population of Israel and other uh, epidemiological characteristics. Now, if you look at the red writings, you see uh, the different uh, steps uh, done throughout the, the pandemic until now. Uh, during January, about a month before the first patient in Israel, Initial response action were all uh, been taken gradually, but uh, rather quickly, uh, Israel borders were uh, closed as part of the containment phase. Flights uh, to and from uh, countries uh, starting from Far East, then Europe, and, and finally, a total closure of all uh, uh, Israel's sky. A quarantine was imposed on all returning Israelis, and the first pa patients were confirmed only in late February. Uh, and then more restrictions were uh, issued. In mid-March, uh, schools were closed. Most of the workers were uh, stayed at home. Transportation was limited. And when we got into April, we were in a total lockdown around the holidays of Easter and Passover. And at, at late uh, April, it started to be more uh, dynamic and focused as uh, the epidemic uh, took place, peaked in uh, certain cities and neighborhoods. Now, throughout May, we started to see the morbidity or mortality curve flattened and restrictions were partially lifted. Uh, and now in many aspects, we are back to routine. Uh, schools are now open with, with restrictions, uh, shops, malls, a uh, working place. And today, uh, exactly today, uh, restaurants are allowed to be opened again. And, and, and uh, there are more uh, steps that are planned in the near future. Now, I want to show you some pictures uh, showing the initial uh, preparation steps back in January and February. You see uh, at the bottom left uh, uh, an example of a strategic meeting in the Ministry of Health. Uh, on top, you see the renovation of the department in the hospital, preparing them to be suitable for COVID-19 patients. You see uh, the acquisition of supplies to expand uh, all the needs. And of course, very important, uh, expanded the capability of diagnostics, uh, relevant diagnostic uh, regarding the virus.
These are the data regarding the daily incidents. And you can uh, clearly see uh, that the outbreak now that we are in late uh, May, uh, the, the numbers are under control. If you look at it, you see uh, uh, the six weeks of a uh, outbreak that started uh, in late February, going all the way up uh, to, um, uh, uh, let's say, early May or late April. Uh, and you see even, I uh, marked the peaks of the uh, highest uh, daily in increase of patients and the highest uh, daily increase of uh, deaths. And you see the classical two weeks uh, gap between them. And since then, we see the numbers going all the way down. Uh, and if we uh, look at the numbers today, and the numbers even, uh, even uh, they are even uh, lower today, we, uh, we have about 2,000 active patients all over Israel, with close to 15,000 uh, patients recovered, uh, and just a few dozen uh, severely ill and ventilated. Now, uh, if you look uh, just uh, in short uh, to appreciate the, uh, the numbers in uh, the Palestinian territories just beside Israel, you see that the, the numbers are very small. And uh, uh, this is uh, secondary to the self-imposed uh, lockdown by the Palestinians that helped uh, uh, get to these low numbers. And I should mention that the Palestinians and Israel had some interaction between them regarding medical aid. I want to focus on a, a few uh, key points. First of all, the early response, the relatively early response, uh, contributed to the results. Well, there are debates also in Israel uh, regarding the level of restriction and lockdown, uh, mainly because of economical uh, effects and issues. Yet, uh, I think the early response resulted in an early mind changing regarding the upcoming epidemic, even before the first patient in Israel. This led, uh, especially the medical community in Israel, to start preparing, training the medical staff, reorganizing the facilities, and so on. Now, Israel, uh, we in Israel are very accustomed to emergency due to our frequent conflicts and challenges, mainly due to military and security uh, uh, issues. And this um, uh, shortened the time people in Israel changed gear from routine to emergency and started acting accordingly. Now, Israelis, Israelis are not that compliant in uh, everyday life, but during emergency, uh, uh, we are uh, usually recruited to the cause, as they say, and uh, become compliant. There is an old saying in Israel that during crisis, all the nation is an army. Now, our health uh, system uh, has its flaws and struggles, but also many advantages and strengths. Uh, it is professional with worldwide uh, medical connection and specifically our multi-ethnic and cultural diversities uh, of our medical personnel help to connect and communicate uh, with all the population groups. Uh, specifically in, the crisis, in, the, in this crisis, it motivated people to comply with uh, the health regulation. Now, addressing all uh, groups, ethnic, religious groups, using their own language and uh, putting their leaders in front as representative and presenters is crucial. In the community that this didn't happen rapidly and efficiently enough, we saw the negative result. Now the pictures in the slide you see on the right are frames from clips prepared to address this issue. They are uh, prepared in different languages, like you see in the bottom slide, it's in, a, in the Russian language, and of course there were other languages. And in the upper slide, you see uh, the Greek Catholic Archbishop of Jerusalem addressing his, his congregation and asking them not to come uh, to the church and, and keeping distance. And, and this was done by all uh, the religious leaders. And it, this is an important lesson that uh, Many citizens, uh, uh, it's dependent on their um, a group and uh, a religion and ethnic uh, group. Uh, not all are adhering to the uh, government regulation uh, if the, it is not directed through the leaders or through their communication channels. Another uh, important point is the military assistance. This was another major feature. Units, army units were deployed in cities, neighborhoods that were locked down 
uh, and needed help. Other units, especially from the Home uh, Front Command, they were given responsibility to operate hotels that were designated for mild COVID-19 patients. Other military units helped with logistics and uh, technologies to improve the capacity of the health system. And here on the, uh, on the upper uh, right picture, you see uh, two figures. Uh, the right one, uh, you see a soldier. This is actually our chief of staff, the commander of uh, the, uh, the Israel army coming in person to supervise the activities in this uh, uh, ultra uh, Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. And this is a, a unique uh, picture uh, to see. Now, uh, finally, solidarity, uh, especially with uh, the medical personnel in this medical crisis. This is very important. The public uh, started to see the healthcare professionals as their front soldiers with the appropriate appreciation, like you, we appreciate our servicemen and service women. Uh, the same uh, appreciation was towards the medical personnel. Uh, you see the right bottom picture. This was taken outside my hospital, and you see some neighbors came and put uh, uh, hang the flags, and also took some ribbons and uh, formed this word uh, on the left side of the flag. Uh, this is the Hebrew word for thank you, in appreciation for the medical uh, staff. And the two pictures you see with the airplanes. Uh, we're taking on our Independence Day about a month ago. Uh, instead of the usual army parades, the Israeli Air Force has made salute flights over hospitals all around Israel in honor of the healthcare providers. And this uh, support was truly uplifting. And with that, I'll conclude and wish that the pandemic would decline and disappear soon. So thank you and stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Lavon. Uh, my name is Ziad Kazi. I want to thank all our speakers for excellent presentations. I'd like to ask our participants, if they can, to stay for another 10 minutes. We have about um, seven, eight questions I would like to go through rapidly for our uh, uh, speakers. If you have additional questions, please uh, type them in right now, and uh, Dr. Wax will uh, also collect them and help me um, ask them uh, in the time allotted. Those that are not uh, able to reach, we will um, hopefully address them in our Q&A at our website. Um, I'll start some questions uh, first to um, Dr. Sedell. If you don't mind, I'm muting and I'll um, uh, share with you some of the questions that uh, were here. Um, yes, I'm here. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, one of our participants was asking uh, whether you have noticed already uh, some long-term complications of COVID lung disease or have you noticed any increase in atrial fibrillation in COVID patients? Um, you know, on, on the first part, yeah, I I have seen now some patients uh, who were vented for, uh, you know, as usual, well, not as usual, but which is very often the case for prolonged periods. And we've now had some patients that uh, came back to the ER sort of as a secondary representations. Um, and I do think it, probably as any uh, ARDS disease, they, there is some um, lingering uh, pulmonary damage that, that will either take time to heal or, or may uh, cause some uh, lasting debilitation. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I'm specifically thinking of one patient who came back and uh, who had a, um, a very high uh, CO2 with a normal pH in general, uh, just appeared to have developed a sort of a um, chronic hypercarbic respiratory disease, which he didn't have before when I looked. Um, so I certainly think it, that's probably not unique necessarily uh, to COVID, um, um, but uh, it, it's certainly probably possible. I, I forgot, I didn't, um, what was the second part? Uh, the second question, question was re related to atrial fibrillation. Uh, what about AFib? Do you think there's an increase in AFib? And then oh, I, I think, I, I can't say whether long-term or not, but certainly I think in the hospital there is increased AFib, but that, that also is not necessarily unusual for critical illness. In general, uh, um, even with sepsis and, and other uh, um, critically ill diseases, you, you do have an increase with uh, of AFib, uh, which generally, I don't know for COVID, but for sepsis ha has uh, shown to be correlated with, with worse outcomes. Well, thank you again for presenting uh, in details uh, these uh, pathophysiological mechanisms that are postulated, some of them have been studied. Um, in terms of therapies, I know you, that's the goal is therapy, as you said. 
Uh, do you uh, think of some potential therapies are more promising than others? And one of our participants actually wanted to ask about vitamin A. In general, um, any uh, theories that you have regarding therapies? Uh, so I would ask, you know, I don't know about vitamin A. I, I would I would ask whether it plays a part in endothelial stabilization or, or in this disease we'd call vascular normalization. Uh, otherwise, I, I think that I, I am very pro um, strategies uh, uh, toward that end. And so, for example, Paul Merrick's group, um, it's from the Frontline Critical Care Group, is recommending you know high dose vitamin C and, and specifically corticosteroids. And, and I see um, that as uh, I would certainly promote that. I, I think that uh, the surviving sepsis gu guidelines actually generally have recommended against early corticosteroid use. Um, and I think that's the one thing which you know when I talk to doctors around the country, I think most people understand that this is an inflammatory response, which is causing a great deal of, of the damage. The downside of corticosteroids is from studies on MERS and SARS-1 that it showed you know, possible delayed viral, um, uh, um, sort of uh, increased viral loads, a decrease uh, um, of getting rid of the vi virus. But you know, I, I think that most people have moved towards using corticosteroids and, and I would promote that. And I see, I just talked to my hospital, to my pharmacist today to, to see about the possibility of getting high dose vitamin C. While it's not proven, you know, I, anything I think um, that is not harmful that may promote endothelial stabilization, uh, I'm for. And then the other thing I think is widespread now, uh, which wasn't widespread in the beginning is the use of anticoagulation. And that is to uh, try to uh, limit the microthrombotic uh, disease. Thank you, Cameron. I'm going to ask you a question that is probably difficult to answer, but I'll ask it to other uh, speakers as well. Do you think we're um, on the way out of the, uh, you know, of the peak of this disease? What What is your clinical sense? From um, I think it's hard. I think my clinical sense is, is uh, partly marred by my hopeful, <laughs> my hopeful sense. But uh, I, I think at least in New York City, uh, uh, we are certainly at much lower levels than, than we were before. And, and so we are, for now, way out of the first peak, uh, way, way out compared to, to what we were. Um, but then again, you know, everyone is uh, wondering now, uh, as people are starting to come out and starting to uh, kind of uh, reemerge um, and to re sort of at least close, more closely socially integrate, uh, what what will what will happen next? But I, I think it. So I don't know what the next peak will be, but I, I can say that certainly in New York City we are uh, way out of that first first wave. Thank you. I'm also like you, anxious about other peaks coming down the coming down the pike. Uh, please stand by if we have any other questions for you. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Van Meter. We have a few questions for you, actually, uh, more practical questions. One of them uh, is about um, the. Uh, chamber. Can you improvise a hyperbaric chamber in a commercial aircraft? That's one question that came through. At least by um, just a conjecture, you could say that could be done. Um, because the uh, shell of the uh, aircraft is able to take a pressure differential um, when you're at 30 or, or uh, 40,000 feet. Uh, the um, pressure difference would allow a treatment pressure down on surface where you pressurize the interior of the plane. But um, you would have to, the, the logistics might be difficult. Um, uh, you know, aircraft probably have to remain in an airfield unless they had their wings clipped and were uh, brought uh, much like the uh, shuttle uh, through uh, in California when it was uh, brought down an avenue for a museum. Um, but I think um, it's probably uh, simpler to, and, and, and if the therapy, if the other thing is, you know, uh, interceding uh, with compassionate care uh, would be very difficult. The ICU patients uh, going to an aircraft, that would be uh, almost next to an impossibility. On some of these trials that uh, have proceeded with the IRB, questions always, uh, what's the proximity of the chamber to the ICU? And would you, in transport of the critical patients, uh, have a, a difficult transition of care through hallways, uh, contamination potential, and um, uh, again, uh, all of the monitoring difficulties that might occur. Um, 
So um, it probably uh, probably in the future, if this is a therapy that uh, can be used, it probably would require a, a chambers to be quite close for very severely ill patients, trying to prevent them from crashing, uh, quite close to uh, uh, either hospital wards or um, ICUs that in in the own right. There are. Uh, quite a nice distribution of hyperbaric chambers, uh, multiplace and monoplace throughout the United States, a surprisingly large number. And uh, probably with selectivity at the beginning, um, those chambers that are now deployed at hospitals could could probably handle everything for, for a while. It's just that if, uh, if it became a, a well-used therapy, um, then it might overload. And uh, and that's where the thought by some engineers that an aircraft fuselage could be used as a hyperbaric chamber. Okay, two quick questions, if you don't mind, Zwigan, for the sake of time. Yes. Uh, what are the total number of hyperbaric chambers? So what is the national capacity of this in the US? And then what about uh, intubated patients? That's a common question. Yes. Uh, uh, the intubated patients may be treated in uh, monoplaces or multiplaces. Now, um, the multiplaces are just like large, either rectangular walk-in rooms now, like Karolinska Institute in Stockholm uh, and many other places. I think even Israel, um, I might stand to be corrected, has one of the rectangular large chambers or cylindrical large chambers, like you saw uh, on the uh, in 1918. Um, and the monoplaces really require mono designating just one patient, and um, the vent, but still they can be intubated and go in with critical care management. So yes, uh, that's not a problem uh, with an experienced hyperbaric crew uh, of physicians and technicians and nurses. And what about a total number, Keith? Total number, number. Yes, quickly a number. There, there probably are about five hundred. Uh, chamber sites in the country now, maybe even more, and uh, a few military sites additionally. One more question on numbers. Uh, one of our participants asked, how many patients have already been treated with uh, hyperbaric COVID? We think, well, we think that um, the number in China, uh, China, I think, got up now to about 32. The number in Opelousas is about, uh, still small, probably uh, 18 to 20. And um, the um, and then there have probably quietly been treatments of patients that have not been reported. Uh, so it's still in its infancy, as you can imagine. Thank you. And that's Thank that's you. why these trials are going to be so exciting. Absolutely. Good luck with uh, with those trials. We look forward to an update from you. Thank yes. you. Uh, answers. Uh, I want to turn it over to Dr. Wax. See if he has any questions in his queue. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Ziad. Uh, just a couple of questions for Dr. Lebone. Uh, the first question is, uh, uh, does he have any um, information about you know, treatments uh, that were received in the Palestinian uh, territories? Uh, the, the numbers of, of patients uh, with COVID-19 seem to be quite low. Uh, do you have any information regarding uh, treatments, patients in ICUs, uh, intubations, that sort of thing? Uh, well, actually, uh, we don't have uh, the exact numbers. Uh, I, we know that the numbers in uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, territories uh, of patients are very uh, small. Uh, there are uh, general hospitals. There are some collaborations that were done on humanitarian uh, uh, basis, but I don't have the exact uh, numbers. Uh, so I cannot... Uh, uh, give more information about that, but I know that there are some uh, uh, connection, especially with the uh, hospitals in the southern part of Israel and in Jerusalem, that share some information regarding protocols. Uh, beyond that, I cannot give more information. I know that there are less than 10 fatalities throughout all the two and a half months, so it's so probably uh, there are not more patients than that at uh, this uh, current time. Okay, great. Thank you. And the, the last question is, uh, you mentioned that the uh, Israeli schools uh, are reopening. Do you have any uh, information about the, the modifications uh, the schools have taken in, in terms of uh, facilitating the reopening? 
Well, of course, uh, because I'm also a parent. I have four children, and they are all uh, back uh, in, school, in kindergarten. Uh, uh, children uh, uh, from uh, the age of six and above need to wear their masks uh, during the day or most of the day. Uh, they are they they try to uh, have some distancing uh, in the classroom and especially in the recess, trying to to put the children in in a, in a zigzag. Uh, recesses and uh, uh, intermissions. Uh, the teachers uh, wear also all kind of uh, masks that help them uh, to protect because they are, of course, uh, more in risk than uh, the children. Uh, uh, we know that in the recent uh, days, there was some very minor uh, clusters of uh, schools here and there in Israel that uh, a, a, a student or a teacher were diagnosed uh, positively to COVID-19. So uh, uh, the class and even all the school went into quarantine. So it's not totally clear, but if you look at the million and a half students that uh, returned to, to school, we don't have a larger outbreak. And it started like two weeks ago. So, so we have to see about that. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I'd like to just uh, thank um, our moderator, uh, uh, Luis Moreno from uh, AAEM, um, as well as uh, our three speakers, uh, Dr. Kyle Sedell, Dr. Ben Meter, and Dr. Lebone for uh, really excellent uh, presentations, um, really superb. Uh, this.